Hello, everyone, and welcome to worship for this second Sunday in Lent. My name is Melissa McDade, and I'm the pastor at St. Paul and Norrisville United Methodist Churches, and we are honored that you're joining us today. Um, you might want to get your altar area ready for Lent. I mentioned last week, um, if you have a candle, maybe a purple one, although any color will do. I have a little purple cloth here. Um, I have a cross. Um, this one's made out of big nails, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but any cross will do. If you have one, you can put your Bible there. You can put your devotional material there for Lent. Um, whatever happens to, um, or, or maybe some pictures of some sort, whatever you think works for your prayer time, your devotional time, um, for you and your family, um, whatever pulls you together um, and makes you think about God for at least a few moments each day. This is the second Sunday of Lent. We're going to be talking about the cross, and I want to share with you this call to worship. It's by Steve Garnis Holmes. The cross that Jesus invites us to take up is not an abstract thought, nor does it denote religious faith, no matter how devout. The cross in Jesus' day was not a logo or a metaphor. It was not a kneeling bench on which believers felt holy. The cross was an instrument of pain, shame, absolute loss, and death. It was a real weapon. The only way to take it up was to become its victim. What can it mean to take up the cross but to suffer it? It means to be in solidarity with those who are oppressed, to be one with those who are condemned, to carry in your heart the sorrow of those who suffer, and to pray and to act on their behalf. It is to live for the sake of the least of your sisters and brothers. To take up your cross is to let go of your ego, your willful, willfulness, your desires, and to be led wholly by God's self-giving passion for the world, especially for the poor and the powerless. It is to be willing to suffer for the sake of the world, to work and even endure loss for the sake of the community's gain. You do, not, uh, you do this not out of duty or belief that you ought to be miserable so others can be happy, but you do it out of joy, pure joy in the gift of life and pure love. To take up your cross is to give your life for the life of the world because that is your delight, trusting that as you empty yourself of, one, of your one small lone life for the sake of compassion, the one who gives life gives it to you abundantly, infinitely, and eternally, and still full of joy, overflowing with joy, radiant with divine, immortal joy. Let us pray. O oh God of love, power, and faithfulness, we journey with your Son ever closer to Jerusalem, to his cross, his true destiny. We hear his words, take up your cross and follow me, but we aren't sure if it's the crosses of this life or the actual cross of death. We hear his words, deny yourself and wonder which self it is, the self we put on for others or the self-centered self that wants it all for ourselves. Whichever it is, it seems like Jesus sure is asking a lot of us and we aren't sure we can do this. God, we will need your Holy Spirit to be able to do this. God, we will need your grace and mercy to be able to do this. We remember that you empowered your disciples, the early Christians, and others who had decided to follow you. We believe that you will do likewise for us. Amen. Our gospel lesson for today is from Mark's Gospel in the 8th chapter, verses 31 through 38. It goes like this. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, 
If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends the reading of our scripture for today. May God add understanding to all of us. I don't have a book for the kids today. Um, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about crosses. So like I said, um, find the crosses in your house or, or make one yourself. Um, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, I said last week, this one is made out of nails um, and they are wired together. And it reminds us of the three nails that, um, um, uh, that went into Jesus on the, on the cross in his crucifixion, one in each hand and one through both of his feet. Um, this is another one that I have at home, and for St. Paul folks especially, it'll be a little familiar because it's made by the same person who made the big one in our sanctuary many, many years ago. And um, you can probably see that it says Jesus, J-E-S, the big S, U-S. So, um, and if you've never seen this kind of cross before, it's got a couple other symbols embedded in it. The first at the top is the shepherd's crook. Jesus we call the good shepherd. Um, and we remember the, the shepherds that came at his birth. So, and then this, maybe if you turn it this way, it looks a little bit more realistic. Um, it's a fish, believe it or not. So here's the head of the fish and here's the tail. Um, so it looks a little bit different. But, um, and Jesus um, called fishermen for his disciples. Um, many of his miracles involved fish. He fed the disciples fish at breakfast after the resurrection. He fed 5,000 people on a hillside um, with a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Um, so, and fish were important in the life of that community um, in that era. So, uh, so they were important, uh, um, uh, uh, important to Jesus. So this is one that a friend brought back uh, from El Salvador, um, and it's got a beautiful picture on it, um, painted by a, a local person there. Um, I like that one a lot. Um, many of us wear a cross, a different kind, different kinds. Um, this one's made out of stones. Um, I have this one that's made out of wood that was um, a gift um, from Tom, from my husband many, many years ago. Um, our oldest daughter, Shannon, was young, and I always tell the story that it has little teeth marks in it because she chewed on it, um, but that's part of what makes it special. So, um, um, so, so talk about the crosses that you might have. You might have some stories of your own. Maybe it's some a cross from a grandparent or um, a cross you bought at a special place and a special time in your life. So, so talk about what the cross is. Um, and we're going to be talking in the sermon today about um, what the cross was for Jesus. And really, that's a theme throughout all of Lent as we go through Good Friday and into the resurrection. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, if any of you want to become my followers, be assured of a good time. A life of wealth and plenty, of good health, and count on the fact that everything will run smoothly for you from this time forward. That's right, isn't it? That's surely in the Bible someplace, isn't it? After all, that's what all those TV preachers claim. Oh, I wish. But my friends, we all know that is not what Jesus says ever about a life of discipleship. Jesus promises the exact opposite, in fact. 
I remember an old friend named Bob Harris, who was the pastor at the Shrewsbury Assembly of God for many years. And I heard him say once that you might take Jesus as your savior one day, and the next day might be the worst day of your life. And he talked about how being faithful doesn't guarantee any of us a life of comfort and bliss. No, instead, a life of faith gets us through those times when our lives are the most difficult. And that's what Jesus meant. He promised a journey with him that takes us to the cross, a journey that will require faith in order to make it all the way through. This gospel story is a momentous story, a pivotal moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples. It's the moment that everything changes. But let me back up a little bit and start a few verses before our passage today to set the stage. The disciples were with Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, a village about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And it was a fascinating village because it was a sort of the retirement village for Roman officials of the day. It was built in a valley surrounded um, by hills at the foot of Mount Hermon. It was also known as the capital of the cults. It was considered the birthplace of the god Pan in Greek mythology, and there were temples and idols all over the place representing that. So as the disciples walked with Jesus through the village, they would have looked around at all the temples and all the idols, the statues, and the images of the gods. And it was in that moment, in that place, when Jesus asked them a simple question, who do you say that I am? And in the midst of all the gods of the known world, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter turns to Jesus and says, you are the Christ. Maybe Peter had known that for some time. Maybe he realized it as they walked through the village with all the temples and the idols and the statues surrounding them. But either way, this was a moment of realization and declaration about the nature of Jesus, whom they had decided to follow. Now, Jesus doesn't deny it. And probably the disciples wanted to go and shout the news to everybody in the entire village to introduce them to a different kind of God and announce this good news to the entire world. But Jesus says something very puzzling to them. In verse 30, he says, don't tell anyone. It was a pretty stern response, and the disciples probably felt like the wind had been knocked out of them. But then Jesus went on to talk to them. And this is where our reading for today starts, about how the Son of Man would suffer and be rejected and killed. Jesus tells his disciples the uncomfortable reality of his ministry. He's going to die. And not a peaceful death. He's going to suffer and be crucified. The death will be pain and anguish and despair. And Jesus is willing to talk about it. Now, imagine that you are the disciples. You've been following Jesus around, learning and listening from him. You've left your old life and lived on the road with him. You've abandoned your fishing business, hung up your tax collector's license. You've witnessed him feed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. You've seen him be, bring a dead girl back to life. You're convinced that he is indeed the Messiah that all of Israel has been waiting for for centuries you're a part of all this, an eyewitness, a companion of Jesus. And now, of all things, Jesus is spending time talking about his death and leaving you and all the disciples behind. Peter can't take it. He had seen Jesus walk on water. How could he die now? It was unthinkable. It wasn't supposed to happen to the Messiah. Peter and all the disciples were expecting what they had always been taught to expect, that the Messiah would be a conqueror, a warrior Messiah, and would restore Israel to power and glory. Here, now, Jesus the Messiah is acknowledging defeat. It was confusing and just too much to take. So Peter rebukes Jesus, taking Jesus aside 
Peter tries to talk to Jesus. He tries to talk some sense into him. He's critical of what Jesus is saying. Now, the reason Jesus calls Peter Satan isn't because Peter is possessed by or, or evil in any way. The word Satan means tempter. And from ancient times, he's been offering humankind alternatives to what God truly wants. Peter wants to keep Jesus safe, to keep his life from being wasted. They've come so far. He wants to save it, to preserve it, to figure out a safer, more reasonable way for Jesus to be Lord. When Jesus rebuked Peter that fateful day, he actually offered us all a gift. Only Jesus' gift had some strings, some conditions attached. Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life will save it. In other words, the more we try to bottle up and preserve our life, the more we conserve it, the more we hold on to it and protect it, the less of life we actually will experience and enjoy. And the more of our life that we share, the more we give away, the more we let it flow out through our fingertips, then the more of life we will actually experience and enjoy. Preacher and writer Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way. The deep secret of Jesus's hard words to us in this passage is that our fear of suffering and death robs us of life because fear of death always turns into fear of life, into a stingy, cautious way of living that is not really living at all. The deep secret of Jesus's hard words is that the way to have abundant life is not to save it, but to spend it, to give it away, because life cannot be shut up and saved any more than a bird can be put in a shoebox and stored on a closet shelf. See, for those disciples, until that day, there was a certain glamour, a certain prestige in following Jesus. Those disciples were hanging out with the coolest guy in Israel. Crowds were flocking to him. Miracles never seemed to stop coming. The teaching was amazing. And then this is where everything changes. That pivotal moment, like I said before. The disciples learned there is a cost to discipleship. It doesn't come on our terms. God doesn't come on our terms. We can't create a cozy religion or a comfortable way of discipleship. We can't make God or Jesus into what we want, into our skin color or into our ethnicity or into our nationality, into our pay grade, into our denomination or religious affiliation, into our political ideals. Jesus never fits our mold. He never did for Peter and the other disciples, and he won't for us either. So Jesus says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. But what does that mean? What does it mean to take up your cross? To use a quote from the movie, The Princess Bride, we keep using those words, but I do not think they mean what we think they mean. The word deny in Greek is used only one other time in the New Testament, and that is in the high priest's courtyard on the night Jesus is betrayed, when Peter denies knowing Jesus. Think about that for a moment. Hmm. We're not talking about giving up this or that for Lent. This isn't about abstinence or fasting. It's not about all we've had to give up because of COVID this year. One author put it this way, denying yourself is to put aside your own interests, your own life, in order to take up God's interests. It's not about giving up a little part of your life, some symbolic part, a few hours of your day or 10% of your income or a few hours a week in church. Nope. Jesus is saying that a little piece of your life doesn't cut it. I want it all. That sounds like foolish talk, but Jesus doesn't stop there. Pick up your cross, he says. 
Jesus is not talking about wearing a cross around your neck. It's not about jewelry or hanging it on our walls and an art display, nor is he talking about something that happens to us that we did not choose, like an illness or a tragedy. And sometimes people call that their cross to bear, and that's not exactly correct. Neither is the cross a pitchfork to condemn others for behavior that we deem immoral. <coughs> excuse me, immoral. It's not a microphone to project our voices over those whose voices we believe should be silenced. Jesus does not say to climb to the top of the cross and stand above it, but instead to take it up, to raise it above ourselves so that we are standing beneath it. Underneath the cross is a place to reconcile how great a love Jesus has given us and what that means for our lives. It is an invitation to grow and recognize the depths of God's love and the power Jesus demonstrated in the conquering death. Jesus didn't have to follow the way of the cross. He never promised it would be easy, but he urges us to die to our own desires and discover God's desires. See, what Peter didn't understand is that Jesus' life doesn't have limits that the more of it that's poured out, the more he actually had to share. What Peter didn't understand, and what we too often fail to understand, is that life is not meant to be bottled or saved or preserved. It is always meant to be poured out, whether it's Jesus's life or ours. Think about it this way. Imagine hiking high up in the mountains, high above the houses and the fields and people, high up to where the valley looks small, far down below you. And there you come upon this beautiful crystal clear spring. Water is kind of bubbling up out of the side of the mountain, like Moses had just been there Moses, uh, moments before and struck a rock with a staff and the water poured forth. And the sound of the springs gurgling is like music and the water splashes into a tiny pool and then dances down a chain of smooth rocks. It's so beautiful that you can't help but reach your hand out into the pool and take a deep drink. And then you realize you want some of that water with you. So you hold your water bottle under the freshly flowing water and you fill it up and then you screw on the lid and tuck it safely back into your pack. And with one final glance back at the beautiful scene, you hoist your pack on your back and hike down the mountain to your car. And you drive back to town and home and work and life. And a week or two later, you finally get around to unloading your pack and you realize you never pulled out that water bottle from your hike. And it's still in there with its sacred liquid content safely stored inside. So you smile and you open it up and you take a little sip but it's not the same. It's still drinkable to be sure. It's still water, but it's different. It's lost its essence, its freshness, its life, because it's shut up inside that plastic container instead of dancing down the side of the mountain. Hmm. Let me put it this way. You can try to save your life, conserve it, extend it. You can do everything imaginable to make sure you're safe and even eventually had, um, uh, and, and that every eventuality has been considered, that every risk has been managed. You can try to stockpile your life into a 401k. You can try to live that way, but don't expect to enjoy it very much. And don't expect to be missed when your safe, comfortable life finally comes to an end and no one really notices that you're gone. The more you try to hold on to life, the less you'll have. And the more of your life that you give away, the more you'll actually have. You know the old adage that anything worthwhile in life is, is obtained through struggle. Nothing important comes to us without some degree of difficulty. The facts of faith are that a walk with Jesus that is an easy stroll through the park wouldn't be much good to us. We know that an easy stroll would offer us no forgiveness, 
would not be able to mend our brokenness, would offer us no healing. And those are the things that we need on a daily basis, but most especially in the tough times. If Jesus had not gone to everlasting life through the suffering of the cross, neither would we be able to look forward to life everlasting. Barbara Brown Taylor says this too. We need not head straight to Easter from the spa or the shopping mall. No. We too walk the way of the cross. But the good news is we don't stop there. We journey through the cross to the resurrection. Remember, every Sunday, even in Lent, is a celebration of the resurrection. It is through the cross that we come to understand the full power of God. Choosing the cross is difficult work, and it only comes through reframing our minds to understand Jesus' humility, through denying our own identities and the ways of the human world, and through taking up the cross, standing under it, that we begin to understand the depth of God's love for all of us, not just as individuals, but for the whole world, everybody, everybody. When we participate in this kind of relationship with God, we're able to comprehend just a smidgen of the love that God has for us. Let me end with this devotion that uh, came in an email just this week. It reminded me of when a teenager tells a parent, you've ruined my life because of your rules and your nagging or whatever that parent might be doing to them that they think is so awful. Hmm? I think we've all been there one, one position or the other. huh? Uh, this is from a fellow named David Shear, who's a Lutheran pastor. He says, you ruined my life. I had power and privilege. I had beauty and blessing. You called me to leave it behind. It was terrifying. You told me to come and die. How scary is that proposition? I tiptoed forward and then retreated. I inched toward it and then backed away. You challenged me with a gracious invitation. I let go and then grasped for control again. You told me that loss was the only real gain. Couldn't there be another way, I wondered? But you continued inviting. I finally gave up my life that I had built for myself. I let go like you asked. You completely ruined my life. In those ruins were where true life was found. And it was glorious. My friends, as we travel through this Lent, this Lentiest of Lents, this pandemic year, take stock of all the ways that we can deny ourselves and take up the cross of Jesus and know that it is indeed glorious. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O crucified one, you took up your cross for our sakes. Give us courage to take up our crosses for your sake. Help us to forget our own wants so that we can focus more clearly on what you want for us. Lead us into your kingdom so that we can show the world that your kingdom is here and now. Take us as we are, Lord, and make us your own. Amen. This is the time when we're in church together that we share joys and thanksgivings um, and um, just, just whatever we feel like sharing at a particular time, the ways that God is at work in our lives. We were all praying for a, a woman um, in the New Freedom area who was lost um, and now she's found. Um, so that's good. I don't know any of the details. Um, and we don't need to know either. So, um, but luckily um, she is safe again. Our friend Carl um, is doing much better um, battling COVID, but um, uh, with the antibodies getting stronger each day. Um, our friend Bernie, um, that we know from the vegetable stand in our community, um, is home now after suffering a stroke. Um, and we pray God's blessings on him and his dad, whom he lives with. Um, and um, hopefully he will be well and strong again soon. Let us pray. Holy, gracious God, sometimes your words are so strange to us. You tell us to take up our cross, but we are sometimes not sure what that means. We are much like Peter, 
so full of questions and uncertainty. And yet we hear your words that to save our life, we need to lose it. We need to change it. We need to deny the power of those worldly things in our lives and focus on the gospel. We need to live our lives knowing that your love has changed us. And we should witness to that for others each day of our lives. Guide us, Lord, to take up your cross and follow you. This week, we passed the half million mark of COVID deaths just in our own country. Schools are going back to session and rates are still higher than we want them to be. Protect our frontline workers, Lord, and now our teachers and staff and students. Help the vaccine roll out to go more smoothly and to reach more people as yet more vaccines are approved for use. Strengthen the folks in Texas, still reeling from ice and snow, the frozen pipes, the lack of water, the stress of it all. Bring comfort to those who grieve the loss of loved ones. Bring hope and healing to those who are ill. Steady those who are still without jobs. O Lord, come and fill us with your peace. Holy Spirit, unlock our hearts settle our minds and guide our way so that we may bring words of peace to the people who need to hear them most. May this peace be firmly rooted in your grace and justice and love. We pray this in the name of the Prince of Peace, your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the time in our worship service where we share our offering. Um, and you can do that um, by mail. Um, and if you go to our, our website, norrisvillechurch.com, it will give addresses for both churches um, and, um, and, and uh, help you um, through that. And thank you so much for all you've done to support us in this difficult year um, and uh, help us to continue our ministries. Um, the benediction today is yet another reading about the cross. You know, there's a lot of them out there and they're so good um, and make us think. So let me share this. This is um, uh, um, from a, um, a website called Interrupting the Silence. It's called Denying Self, Choosing Christ. The way of Christ, self-denial, reminds us that our life is not our own. It belongs to God. It reminds us that we are not in control. God is. Our life is not about us, it's about God. There is great freedom in knowing these things. We are free to be fully alive. <laughs> Through self-denial, our failing, our falling down becomes rising up. Losing is saving and death is resurrection. As long as we believe our life is about us, we will continue to exercise power over others try to save ourselves, control our circumstances, and maybe even rebuke Jesus. Jesus rarely ex exercised power over others or tried to control circumstances. He simply made different choices. Self-denial is not about being out of control or powerless. It's about the choices we make. Jesus chose to give in a world that takes to love in a world that hates, to heal in a world that injures, to give life in a world that kills. He offered mercy when others sought vengeance, forgiveness when others condemned, and compassion when others were indifferent. He trusted God's abundance when others said that was, there was not enough. With each choice, he denied himself and showed God was present. At some point, those kind of choices will catch the attention of and offend those who live and profit by power, control, and looking out for number one. They will not deny themselves. They will respond. Jesus said they would. He knew that he would be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes. It happens in every age for those who choose the path of self-denial. When it happened for Jesus, he made one last choice. He chose resurrection over survival. Hmm. My friends, go in peace and be safe in all that you do. Amen. <laughs>